All right. Yeah. All snacked up, ready to go. Let's let's go ahead and we'll get we'll get started today. I think we always open with a prayer, correct? Yep. You now. <laughs> it's a show. It's my show. Uh, it's a show. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just telling somebody else. Apparently, according to Victor Gary, we are all breaking the law coming into the church parking lot because we're turning on double yellow lights. Oh yes, that's true. So we don't need that. Okay. There's only one person here that escaped that because she walked up here. Right. That's right. Even I break the law when I ride my bike, I guess, because I cross the double yellow. Line. So you have to get up on the sidewalk before. But which who walked here? Was it? You walked here? I live down there. Well, yeah, I know. Oh yeah, you live down there, so you're good. Because if you because if you cross the street, then you jaywalk because uh -huh. there's no person to cross it. Yeah. So, unless you cross. It's getting it hard to come to church. Yeah, I know. Well <laughs> so she should get the absolution. Te absolva. Okay. <laughs> I think that's how you say it. I don't take Latin, so, but I think that's how you say you're adult. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good. What's that? We are, although it says preparing live stream. So we had this issue yesterday too. Let me see. Breakout rooms, stop live stream. It seems like we are live streaming. Here, I'll tell you what, you, um, go to Facebook and see if we're there. Because yeah. I had this thing come up yesterday that said preparing live stream and it was on the whole time with Mana. So I don't know if Mana got on there either, to you know, be honest. It gives us a little update on things happening here. If there's any, any... Yeah, that's right. I think prayer concerns, updates, things right. like that. So um, anything we need to know? I talked to Webb Rose yesterday. Um, yep. The prayer request that went out said that he had had knee surgery, but he did. He just had a really bad fall. Um, but he, but it was a couple weeks ago. Yeah. But I think he was going to try to go to choir last night. So he did. He, he made it. Yeah. Is he there? So oh, good. There well, thank you, because I knew he had a fall, but then when I saw the surgery, I thought that was the yeah. follow-up for update. So thank yeah. you for clarifying that. So Webb Rose had a fall, hurt his knee, but right. not surgery. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty sore. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Yeah. 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 And Kay Kirsten had a fall too. Oh, um, broke okay. up just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, she's okay. She's um, having trouble uh, getting the medical care. Yeah. So yeah, her referral for to see a hand specialist is done. Yeah. Yeah. Getting, getting medical care. So. Yeah. So she's a week in and I'm still without a cast, I think, right? Yeah, she got a brace yesterday. A brace, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So here you are. Okay. Facebook is on. Okay. Wait, any other updates? And I don't know if you usually do those before we go live on Facebook, but yeah. usually but those were yeah, too much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I can't think of any other news. Um, I will say this. Uh Pentecost Sunday is the 19th, so it seems like it's coming early, at least to me, in this year. Um, what's that? Wear red. Wear red. And um, if you have, um, if you're fluent in another language, we are going to bring back that. We've done that a few times before where we've done the Lord's Prayer in multiple languages. And so um, kind of was thinking about it and then talked to an exchange student from Germany who's here and I thought I haven't asked her yet I don't know if she'll do it she's a high school student but it'd be nice to have her do that that would be her original language so I always love the creed because uh in Germany because they're Heiligen Geist I was just uh just has a hello to it the Holy Ghost the Holy the Heiligen Geist uh, I always like that when we were in worship at Germany uh and then also graduates are going to be celebrated on May 9th so or excuse me June 9th Apologize. So we'll be celebrating them at preschool Sunday on June second. So we'll we'll have um, both of those things going um, to celebrate our young people on kind of both ends of school. So be invited, be encouraged. All right. Yes, please. Uh, we have. I have actually had a, well, we had a couple of signups for ladies' night out, and um, but 
there's been a specific request to be this game night, but it is not really seems very well thought of. <laughs> so if you want to come, please sign up. Otherwise, I'm probably going to cancel the interview. Right. Right. Game yeah. night. Yeah, so if you've been seeing that on the announcements, game night, ladies' night out the uh, next Tuesday. Yeah, unfortunately, it's the same night as hometown band. We didn't yeah. know that hometown band was yeah. doing this. Yeah, we're, we talked with them about getting more like a month's notice rather yeah. than like a couple a week and a half or so. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So, yep, we'll fix that. But um, yeah, I don't know when their concert is. Is it seven? And ladies' night out at 6 30? Yeah, yeah, six. So kinda, yeah. They kind of come so over six. Be the other things we could. Just get together for an hour and then go over to the yeah. band too. So or an hour and a half and hit a half an hour. Yeah, yeah whatever. So, so okay. Any other, anything else before we get started? And we will end at eleven forty-five. I got that notice last time. Sorry about that. I did not have the end time memo. Um, so yeah, um, I do now. All right. Only the father knows that. Only the father knows the the place and the time of the ending. Of it. Yeah. And and we will. I have I have gone through two chapters, two whole chapters, which will kind of make sense for us. We won't go farther than chapter 18. If we're done with chapter 18, 1140, we're going to be done because chapter 19 and 20 really um, kind of need to go together or even by themselves because we get into a new section uh, of, of that. Oops, that's my phone going off. Yeah, my brother's been calling me a lot. He likes to call me during the day on weekdays, but... Anyway, okay, let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your word and for all who are gathered here. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we uh, may be drawn into your word and that your word may send us out uh, into a world that is in need of uh, um, what we're going to hear today and uh, the blessings that we hear and uh, the workings of uh, your, your, um, your workings in our in our world, your intangibles in our tangible world. And so um, bless us in this hearing um, and speaking, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We'll jump in. We are in Exodus 17. You didn't know. And we'll start with chapter one, or excuse me, with first one here. Um, yeah, there we are. How about us? Get to share here if I can find it. There you are. Whoops. Okay. The problem with faith with this is that this little guy on the top gets in the way. Here we go. Here's what we want to share. All right. And I just closed it. That's good. Okay. Let's try that again. My apologies. Yeah. I went to open it and I hit I hit the uh, close button instead. So hopefully this will come back. And there it is. All right. Um. Okay. My apologies here, guys. I had this all ready. I had the screen open and ready to go, and then I accidentally closed it. So it'll take me just a minute here to get back to Exodus 17. All right. And for us to get here to our Bible. Here as well. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started. This over. Water from the rock. We're going to get some complaining again. By the way, as you'll see on here, there are references if you want to note those um, to num like here to Numbers 20, 1 through, 1 through 13. So we get some. Um, um, what I want to say, uh, you can get a cross reference there with this story kind of told told again in, the, in that particular context. So uh, many of these stories told and retold that oral tradition get written down in the five books of Moses. What's that? Can you enlarge the, uh, the print? The print? Yes, I can. 
I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go. People are blind. <laughs> yep, I understand that. I resemble that remark sometimes. All right. I'm going to do it here. I'm sorry to be rattled. My all the work that I did this morning is now gone because I have finished. No, it's okay. It's all the work I had this morning is gone because I did a bunch of highlighting and some commentary. But we'll fly here. We'll be fine. All right. Is that better? There you go. Yeah, okay. That's better. Let's get this first section. All in the right co community. <laughs> Set out from the desert. From the desert of sin. <laughs> Traveling from place to place. As the Lord commanded. They camped at they camped at a Rephidim. We camped at Rephidim, but there was no water from for the people to drink. So they quarreled with, with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel? Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the book? Why do you put the Lord to, to the test? But the people were thirsty. For water. And they and they grumbled against Moses. They said, "Why do you bring us up? Why do you bring us up? Of, why do you bring us up of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock?" To die of thirst. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I what am I to do with these people? They are they are ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go up. Go out in front of the people and take go out in front of the people, take with you and in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. And go. You need a marker. Okay. <laughs> Let me finish that section because you're doing great. I will be standing there in the front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, which we'll stop there and see that they mean um, <clears throat> test, and I think the other one's quarrel. Yes, so test and quarrel. <laughs> God has a little fun with that, right? Or Moses had a little fun with that. Because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Okay, great, thank you. So what do you see in here? Does, does this look familiar? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're whining. They're whining again. Yes. You say as you have your coffee and your snacks over know. there. Right. <laughs> exactly. You sit from the from the place of privilege talking about their whining again. Yes. They're quarreling and they're testing. Right? They're quarreling with Moses. And Moses says, and by quarreling with me, you're testing God. Right? Again, there's a pattern here. Moses says, your quarrel isn't with me. 
your quarrel is with God, right? But now it seems like they're ready to kill Moses. Yeah. As, as far as what he is is uh, at least perceiving here, right? Okay. What else do you see? Maybe some things that are parallels or themes that are coming up again, or or something that's sticking out to you. Right. The Lord will provide for them again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but yes, yeah, right. It's interesting that the staff brought destruction to Egypt and brought salvation, you know, water yeah. to the Hebrew. Right. Yeah, the staff, boom, parts the Red Sea. Or God parts the Red Sea, but the staff is stuck. Blood in the Nile. Blood in the Nile, the first, yes, right. Yeah. Yeah, the staff gets connected with water quite a bit here. So there was there was the poisoning of the water, the blood, the undrinkable water. Then it was the parting of the sea. Then it was the covering of, of the, the unparting of the sea to, to wash over the, um, the, the uh, Egyptian soldiers coming after them. And now it's striking the rock and water comes out of the rock. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess I've never seen this before. Uh, verse six, I will be standing there in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh. And who can? Yeah, that's a question I had too. Is is this an invisible presence? Does Moses see it? Do the people see it? It seems like seeing the face of God is not something you can see. So, um, but there is some connection here, though, between God and the rock. Is I think of Christ as the rock mm -hmm. too, and He was struck in living water. Oh, ah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Great connection. The water. Water and blood flowed mingled down, right? That's actually one of the things that's used as evidence to, uh, because water, with, I think it's with asphyxiation, there'd be water and blood mixed uh, in the body. Um, so that's one of the things to note that we know now about what, what happens with bodies when those kinds of things happen to show that Jesus was, was truly dead. Yeah. Maybe it's God working through means too. Yeah. Right, God works seems to work through the earth. That's going to come up again in this in this section, more so in chapter um, in the end here of chapter uh, seventeen. But but uh, but yeah, God works through means. There is water in the desert. I it's, think there's a lesson too for us in that they aren't remembering what God's done for them, but we should take time to remember what God's done for us. Mm -hmm. You know. Because yeah, they are they are not a good example for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not great here, are they? Continuing with the complaining and all that kind of stuff. And maybe even to extend that, our remembrance of, of God's provision should especially be a breath in the midst of panic or anxiety or yeah. uncertainty or trouble or whatever it might be. Because being thirsty is critical what yeah. what is what water is what four days something like that yeah probably less for the children right they mentioned the children this time that's a little bit new uh, and the livestock yep yep so we do have those cows still here or whatever the heck they were sheep something yeah i, I was just noticing at the end of this they were complaining is the lord among us or not mm -hmm. and he says i'll be standing there yeah right yeah, so you have this contrast. The Lord says, I will be present. There's an incarnational uh, sense here, too. The God will be on the rock, standing there, not up in heaven um, with a lightning bolt or something like that, but I will be on the rock. Um, and they, yeah, they're asking, is God there or not? Or with us or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. My commentary says, um, the people of Israel show a hardness of heart like Pharaoh and the Egyptians, which is precisely how Psalm 95 describes these events. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting. Those, those Psalm 95, yeah. 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 Okay. So they've had this provision of food and, or, well, rescue, food and water, and now their hearts are hard. Just like Pharaoh had seen what God could do, he would relent a little bit and then his heart would harden again. Yeah. The, um, right, exactly. And this is, this is, this becomes something that gets remembered again and again. This story gets told again and again, as we'll see um, uh, throughout the scriptures, it'll it'll kind of resurface or parts of it will resurface. You know, we have the 10 commandments here, we have the 10 commandments in another space in the scriptures. And, and we have these stories, they'll resurface again 
in lots of different writings. Um, or the prophets will remind the people, do not be like uh, you were and we were in the in the desert or whatever it might be. And and so it'll come again and again and again and again. A reminder of uh, we're now in a, a difficult time. That's you know usually when you're getting these prophetic writings, Jeremiah and Micah and all these kinds of things. Um, do not be like what we were then. So take to heart that in those times of trouble to turn to the Lord with faith rather than arguing. So hold on, I see you there. Um, yeah, I've got this. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation. Wow. And said, they are people whose hearts go astray, and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger, I swore they shall not enter my rest. Now, before that, this is kind of a reverse psalm. A lot of times you get that, that stuff in the beginning, and then you have Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us teach us. The I will teach them your statutes and we'll sing songs of praise and all of that. But we have all this praise up above. Worship, bow down. Um, the covenant remembrance language here. Oh, we're going to get to that next week. That's going to be super exciting. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. We belong to the Lord. Um, that's the contrast to um, Meribah and Massa. So great, great reference there with Psalm, Psalm 95. Then remember that the GPA God provided again. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. Indeed. All right, yes, please. Well, I was just going to say that there are many times, uh, and apparently the Israelites here, and then the reference to, to the song is that they, they're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and one can say, um, you know, where's the Lord? You know, mm -hmm. people have difficult times. They say, where's the Lord? I've been praying and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And really, he's he's here. Yeah. He's he, in the midst of all of this. He's there. Yep. And and then you take up the rest of the song, uh, you know, so with it, song 23. Uh, you take up the rest of that, and you know that he's there. He's guiding you. And it's not yeah. easy, but it's right. he's there. Yeah. Not he saves me from the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk. The valley of the shadow of death. Yes, please keep the comments a coming. A little fun side note is that Psalm 95 1 is our theme verse for the 75th anniversary. Psalm, what's that? Psalm, Psalm 95. 95. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd forgotten that. Excellent. Thank you for that remembrance as well. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Okay. First one. Psalm 95 1. 95.1. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't. Are you looking at it? We can look at it again here. It's easy to find. Computers are fast. Unless you close them. Yeah, I know. Or hit that too. Gosh, I am not on my best game. I was so prepared, you guys. My goodness. I'm going to remember it all. It's fine. Well, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Yeah. That's the theme verse, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. We sit up here on this beautiful rock up here on that, on the highest, high, almost the highest part of this ridge top, this beautiful view. One quick, yeah. quick comment. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that Moses says, what am I to do with these people? Yeah. It's not saying my people. He's not saying to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> these people. These people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The parents when they're angry at their child, your son. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no, for sure. Yeah. Nope. That is that is absolutely um what happens what happens in the prodigal son. Your son, who you well, he's your brother. He's not just my son, right? So yep, 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 yep. All right. Keep keep them coming. Anything else? That we're as we're on this first section here. There we go. All right, I'm going to pull up on this guy because I own this. I own this. I'm going to use it. Let's see if the highlights are still there. All right, we'll just jump back and forth here. I'm going to move this over. Oh, they're still there. How about that? Yes, I guess God is on the rock for me too. Okay, all right. So we have this kind of, um, uh, we have divine leading. Okay, Brenheim highlights this. 
continuing of the human complaint, um, but the unsurpassable graciousness of God. Once again here, what does God do? Does God say, oh, I'm going to burn these people up, right? We'll get to that part later, because <laughs> that does come. But uh, God just provides again. God recognizes this is a real need. This is a real need. I'm going to answer this. I'm going to answer this, and I'm going to be present here uh, with them. Um, but but what Fredheim notes, too, I think we can all see that. But what's kind of interesting here, and, and um, I think we'll see, and, and you've, you're making the connection with the rock, is that um, it also opens up the sustaining powers of creation for Israel. So this isn't just about God's divine fairy dust from heaven that just makes something out of nothing. God works within the creation. God works within the, the water in the desert that's that's under the rock, right? There is, is that, that God right? takes, yes, right. They work in conjunction. God is not, and I think that's really important for us to, to think about. And I think I'm, I probably mentioned this this last week. My One of my least favorite songs in the world is that Bette Midler, God is watching us from a distance, garbage. This ant, this ant farm or plot winder God who just sets things out or just sort of intervenes every once in a while uh, with, with some magical power that, that comes down kind of out of nowhere. Now, granted, of course, God intervenes, God breaks into the midst of creation, but that's not an absentee God who breaks in from afar. That's a God who is also present with us and is present with the people. And so we get really a typology, a pattern for God too, a God who shows up, a God who is present, not a God who sits up far off in the distance watching us or waiting for um, you know some particular whim to break in, right? So it's an important thing to remember about who God is. Um, and another kind of um, piece to remember here is, as we um, get started in this chapter is that these wilderness stories are, are about people who are between promise and fulfillment, okay? So, and if we think about times when we've been between promise and fulfillment, um, those are a lot of times rough times. They're at the very least they're uncertain, right? And so, what do what do what does the place do you think of between promise and fulfillment require? What do you need in the midst of promise and fulfillment and the in between of that? Patience, okay. Guidance, guidance, yeah. Right, so there are little tracks along the way. We talked about last week how God doesn't just free the people and say, yeah, cool, see you next time. Um, but God walks them and, and slowly is kind of turning their heads towards being ready to be God's people in this in this new land. Don't worry, they'll screw that up too. But We're kind of in that from resurrection to coming yep. again. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we are in an already not yet time. Uh huh. And so we look at our world and and we talk again. Probably talk about that every week in here, but but we uh, groan. You know, the whole creation groans. All the people and the whole creation groans for redemption um, that is promised but not yet fully realized for sure. Yeah, were you going to say? I was going to say faith and faith. trust. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, faith, trust. We can use those interchangeably here. Absolutely, big ones. I think we need to be reminded of the promise because we didn't forget it. Yeah. And then also yeah. people who find God has promised. Yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. There's a gap between what you promised and what our kind of Right. Right. Yeah. Right. There is. And, it, and in fact, even getting back to this um, particular piece here, I'm just going to jump back and forth now. Oops. Sorry. Let me jump to this. That was 95. Let me pull this over here a little bit more. I think that'll be more useful. Um, when the people say, is the Lord among us or not, we can see that as a lack of faith, but there is a kernel of faith in there. It's a little bit like, I believe, help my unbelief, right? My favorite confession of faith in the, all the scripture, I think, um, is that there is an acknowledgement that the Lord is able to be among us. When you say, God, where are you? You are acknowledging that God can be with you, right? Um yeah. It, it also we talked about uh, was he present on the rock? They, could they see him or not? I think this kind of answers that question. No, they can't see him. Seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he's there. Yeah. And it also says that he's not the 
My salvation. Exactly. The yeah. banner of me is love. Uh -huh. Yeah. We do with the preschoolers. Jesus is the rock, and he rolled my blues away. <laughs> Which is, in some ways, theologically inaccurate. If you want to be really picky about it, I like the song, so we'll keep singing it. But, <laughs> but, um, but he doesn't necessarily roll the blues away. <laughs> he's, but he's present in blues, right? Yeah, yeah. Blues would be a great genre of music. They should, I want a blues. I want a dramatic. Uh, uh, interpretation of the Exodus story done to uh, blues music. I'm calling Lynn Manuel Miranda today. <laughs> if anybody has his phone number, because I sure don't. Uh, he doesn't really talk to me. I think he's blocked me actually on um, Twitter. So. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, maybe we could. I'll, well, you know, we'll need we'll need a particular high schooler not to graduate this year in order to do that. I think. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. Um, Let's look back here and see if there's there are others, some nuggets here. Um, um, I think this is also interesting, what Fred Heim notes here, um, that uh, the people journeying, you know, moving, so they, they're, they're coming now a little bit south, they're moving towards the Sinai wilderness, so they're moving a little bit south as they go. Um, but their response to God and Moses is not simply is not simply a complaint. It also recognizes that this this recognizes that disobedience is possible. They could go another way. They are still following Moses. They are still following through here. They are complaining along the way, but they are following. Um, and I like what he says here. He says, "Leading does not entail." I'll blow that up. No, I can't blow that up. I guess leading does not entail coercion. Israel could have taken other paths through the wilderness, so they are on the way. Um, and they kind of move from these occasions of disobedience or obedience, complaint or trust, you know, they're kind of moving throughout this. And so we see the rhythm of our own faith life here, uh, our, our own kind of path as we move through uh, a life of faith, which I think is kind of, kind of interesting. All right. Yeah, please. I think too that they also recognize, recognize and acknowledge God because of all that he had done when they were in Egypt and bringing them out of Egypt. And now things are getting really difficult. Yeah, yeah. At first they didn't have anything to eat. Yep. And then he provided them. They're wondering, okay, where is he now? When, right. You know, is he still with us? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I think the acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. There is an acknowledgement in that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, um, it's important to... Uh, and I'll draw back here too to note that this testing of God is is kind of problematic because the testing kind of implies that well God if you pass this test then I will believe if you do this then I will follow so we get into this transactional relationship with God and the the problem with that it's I mean it's it's fine for God to test the people right there's a reason for that um, but for us then to test God or for the, the people to test God is problematic. And it leads us, it can lead us into um, Fred High Notes here, and I think it's a good a good note and a good pause to um, note that if we enter into this transactional expectation of God, then we also get into the, this kind of understanding of God that, well, if this happens, then God has heard me, and God has heard me because I have said the right words or because I have had enough faith, as if faith is quantitative, right? As if it's, a, as if we need to have, oh, I need to have more faith. I've probably said that before. I just need to have more faith, which maybe can be good and say, well, yeah, I really need, I really need to focus in and trust in this situation. But, but it's not like, oh, oh, if you have, you know, two liters of faith versus one liter of faith, then God will heal your grandma from her cancer, or God will do this particular thing, or God will do that particular thing. But you see how that leads us down a, real, a really dark path. If, if we're testing God, if we're putting tests to the God, putting God to the test, and entering into a kind of transactional relationship with God. And so that's really the ultimate problem of test is it comes back to this wishy squirrel of the whole thing. And that is, will we worship God or will we not? Which is kind of the other side of the question they ask. Which keeps us going, am I doing enough? Am I doing, am I doing enough? Am I doing yep, enough? yep. Am Did I, I put enough? the right things? Did I say the right thing? Did right. I do it? Yeah. And that wasn't the word right. at all. Yeah. Thinking, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jesus must have died for all you other sinners, but I, I do it myself. So uh, there's a 
my daughter, we've been talking about this lately because the songs come up a couple times, but there's a, a song that was on the radio and it's, it's not the most appropriate song probably for a three-year-old, but it has this line, by the time the bar closes and you feel like falling down, I'll carry you home tonight. And that song was on and um, I probably should have been playing, you know, like the Veggie Tales or something like that instead, but it was on the radio. And, um, and Zoe from the back at three years old says, if I if if bar closes and I fall down, nobody carry me home. I walk myself. <laughs> but she's really naming what is yeah. our kind of human yeah. want. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. A lot of this wilderness will go back to um, the Garden of Eden and original sin. It'll also go back to God's creative power, God working within the, the creative. Um, you know, the, the creation itself, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, please. And wondering if you have enough faith is no different than wondering if you've done enough good works. Yep. yep. It really it's isn't. It really isn't. It's How very, very, you very much the same. Daughter, that you said that? What's that? How many times have you reminded your daughter? Oh, many, many, many times. <laughs> yeah. And I will tell you, my response was, that's right, girl, you bet. You will always walk yourself home. Yeah, right. <laughs> Probably don't be falling down. And she didn't know She didn't know what the bar was or any of that kind of stuff, or what falling down meant, what, what causes that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, he goes on to say that testing also plays, places God in the role of a servant, right? God is my, God is my genie, right? Rub the lamp, but oh, I got to rub it on this side. Well, I got to rub it on the bottom, you know, I got to rub it the right way, you know, kind of thing. Um, and uh, and then it endangers faith. It isn't really faith. It's faith. It's faith, but it's faith in myself. It's faith in my doing this thing the right way um, kind of a thing. And we love that as human beings. We we want to be in control. We want to we want to do those kinds of things. OK. All right. All right, we've talked about um, God bringing water um, out of the rock. Uh, um, but I'm extends this in saying that that the world is under the, uh, or scar, excuse me, God brings water into a part of the world that's under chaotic control. The desert is always a sign or always a place of chaos. And the wild animals are out there and the wild plants that grow and, and things like that. So um, there are positive aspects to the desert, of course, Jesus driven out of the wilderness and all that kind of thing, but the wilderness is a chaotic place. And so God is bringing order into, into chaos, not bringing water out of nothing. You strike the rock. These are elements of the earth that are used, but, um, but definitely bringing uh, life in the midst of chaos. Um, yeah. Okay. Couple of uh, other thoughts on this, and we'll move on here in a minute. I want to bring out a couple of, of key points highlighted in red. <laughs> so we note here that water and the law are linked. The Sinai experience is enclosed by wilderness stories. The context in which the law is given to Israel is life in the midst of chaos and disorder. So the striking of the rock is bringing order out of chaos, bringing water. Okay, The people need that. Okay, We're bringing order, calming them down. Right, There's order in that. Um, God will also bring the law in the midst of this. So we're, we're just on the edge of that, of Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. And law will then bring order out of chaos. So just put that in the back of your mind for when we get to that part in the future. Um, and then he also notes here, I think I thought this was good, the gift of the water of life comes from the same source as the gift of the law, a source of life for the community of faith. Even more, water from Sinai testifies to the fact that moral order and cosmic order are inextricably interconnected. Obedience to the law actually does affect the natural order of things. Um, he goes on to talk about this, and I think it's a good example. He says, anyone in the modern era, era, era who has worked to conserve the lakes and streams of this country knows from experience what this means. Without obedience, modern travelers in this increasingly wilderness-shaped world may find themselves without water to drink. And God may not, I don't know about this statement, but God may not be able to come to the rescue this time. I'm not sure about the be able to. God may not come to the rescue this time. So yeah, God's commands, God's order, and the natural world go, go together. We can see that with conservation and care for the earth, the stewardship that we have. What does God do? Creates and then calls us to be good stewards, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, probably time to move on. Let's get to eight through 16. 
All right, we got a little uh, a little uh, action in our movie here. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, "Choose some men for us to go uh, us and go out fight with Amalek." Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Oh, look, the staff is back. Uh, so Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on either side, so his hands were steady until the sun set. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the sword. We'll, we'll read this next part. They kind of go together. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a remembrance in a book and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He set a hand upon the banner of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. I didn't look up our foot up here. I don't know there's something interesting there. Oh, yeah. Maybe I did. It's just a desert. Okay. So we have a little battle here. There are skirmishes along the way. This isn't just an empty, completely empty place. Amalek? Yeah. Let's uh, let's look a little bit at Amalek. Amalek is, and the Amalekites are a people that are out there in the wilderness, and they have continually attacked Israel. Oh, separate, separate group of people. Yeah, separate group of people. Yes, they're not a, they're not within the God's people. They're a separate group. Yeah, yeah. They no. were probably there first and feel like they're being invaded. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that very well may be. They, we, we have from, I can't remember if it's Numbers or where it is, but anyway, we have stories of the Amalekites um, kind of... Uh, trying to destroy God's people. So we have a little bit, the Amalekites represent a little bit of the, of, again, of the sort of the pattern of Pharaoh, trying to eliminate the promise, trying to eliminate God's people. Um, and so they do these, they would do these attacks or when people are straggling from behind, they would come out and attack and kind of kill off the stragglers uh, of God's people from behind. So they were, <clears throat> they were constantly kind of coming at God's people. Right, 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 right. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 25. Okay. Yep. You want to go there? Here, let's go there real quick. Think I took typing class. Okay. Here we go. Deuteronomy is long. Okay. Where are we? Where is it in there? Oh. Yes, here at 17, right? Or where are you getting it earlier? 17. 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey out of Egypt, how he attacked you on your way, on the way, when you were faint and weary and struck down all who lagged behind you. He did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies on every hand in the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Um... Now, what's interesting here is, well, let me let me get you let me get your comments here. What else do you have to say about this Amalek battle? Yes. We can study by what says that the Amalek nomadic tribe descended from Esau. Uh, in Genesis, Israel may have camped near or between the Wadi Riyadh and Wadi Harim, and Amalek would not want them to use either oasis. Yeah, that's what right. I came up with. Yeah. Yeah, which is another, go ahead, sorry. Star water. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is another interesting point because God has provided water for them out of the rock. But so we, we also have, and you'll get this in the scriptures continually, God's economy versus the world's economy. God is an economy of abundance. There is enough for all and all you know, may have enough. Of course, there's some contingency on how we treat our resources and the, the economy of scarcity. Grab all you can because there isn't enough. Okay, those are economies that are in constant battle throughout the scriptures. Yeah, please. Also in this story, you see the staff of prayer and the sword of action. Ah, because there's both. There. Yeah, yeah. Like as long as you have that staff up, you know, it's like our prayers right. are held up. Yeah, and yeah. They were acting. Mm -hmm. Like 
Yeah, definitely. The staff of prayer, the the, the yeah, and that is a posture of prayer to lift up your hands. Um, I don't think it ever, yeah, the sword of action, right? Yep. Yeah. Is that something you've studied before? Because that sounds like a NBSF. NBSF. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So there's this interplay once again, the water and the rock, um, even the water in the Nile or, or, you know, the water in other places. Here, the staff is held up, but then there's also the people go out. This isn't God. This, again, this isn't a lightning bolt from God to just go, oh, zap the Amalekites. Well, and we pray, but God doesn't want us to just sit there sometimes. He wants right. Us to yeah. <laughs> I love the speaker we had one year um, at the youth gathering that said, um, you know, sometimes we're praying for God to do something. And God says, I did do something. I made you. <laughs> yeah, the guy had a Southern accent. If I'm slipping into that, I have a bad habit. Of that. Uh, but I thought that was a great reminder, especially to those young people that, yeah, right. God works. The, the, the most foolish thing I think God has ever done is to work through us, right? <laughs> or uh, maybe I'll just say through me, but and leave you out of it maybe maybe it's better I think. what's that i think god does have a sense of humor yeah 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 but god has us takes a risk by working through us and working through the creation there's a self-limitation that happens with that right okay god is not a god of puppet strings okay um there was something brought up i was gonna get back to be yeah. was that Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. oh, yeah, we're almost there. To me, it's significant that Moses needed help. Yeah. And that he had right. others yeah. around him to help support Yeah, him. this is a little bit of foreshadowing for what's coming up when uh, Moses finally gets a better manager to help him with some things <laughs> coming up here in a minute. Yeah, yeah. So that's good, too. And also, it isn't immediate, right? Yeah, like things take some time to develop. And there's the possibility of defeat. And if Moses can't hold his, his the staff up and it comes down, the Amalekites start to get the advantage, but only when it's held up. So, and there are some questions in this text. Are the is he's on a hill holding it up? It doesn't say that the soldiers can see him. Kind of presumed that he's up in this high place, he's holding it up. Um, are they drawing inspiration from that? Is this an act of faith to say, yeah, God's with us, here we go, kind of a thing? Or is this just some kind of, is it more more magical with the staff? Or is it more, you know, inspirational? Or, or what's kind of happening here? We're kind of left in some some vagueness here about that. I think. Yeah, go ahead. I thought there was a hand or something over here. Oh, here. It kind of shows, too, that you can do more when you have help. Uh -huh. You know, you may not see the help of God, but you may see the help of the friends on either side of you that are there to help you. Right. So that we can't always do it by ourselves. Right, right. And it's like the flood, you know, the, the joke about the flood where the guy's the flood's coming and he's standing on his porch and then and the people walk by and say, Here, we can get you to safety. Yeah. He's like, No, I'm I'm waiting on the Lord. And then he's, you know, it, you guys know the story. It progresses up and finally he dies and said, Lord, why didn't you help me? He's like, I sent you a yeah. I sent you a rescue worker, a boat, a helicopter. <laughs> you know, so in some ways, then to for us, not that not that the friend who helped us is God, but is the presence of God. Yeah. Right. So that we don't distinguish uh that that, that God is saying very clearly here, this is how I work. And I work through means. And sometimes my work takes time. And not only in this battle does it take time, but the Amalekites will, he says that you'll continue to quarrel or you'll continue to fight with them and spar with them. The Amalekites uh, at one point actually, and I can't remember where it is and somebody I'm probably going to look it up, but they eventually do get kind of wiped out. But um, but it takes time for that to happen. Right? Yeah. Is this a... Uh verse 10 and following, is this kind of a proof text for, well, actually eight and following. Mm -hmm. um, is Yahweh in our midst or not in the previous verse? And then it doesn't say anything about, you know, God telling him to hold up the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and he does. And the, the proof text for the previous statement is that uh, the the same rock that hit the, I mean, same staff that hit the rock, mm -hmm. God saying his presence was going to be there, and then he's now lifting that same rod. I, I don't know if that's a great connection, but it just, 
Yeah. Why would it say one statement and then follow it? Yeah. Are you are you kind of saying you mean the consistency of the staff is kind of a is kind of a sign of God's presence? Is that what you're I don't at? Know. I, I'm yeah. wondering if we could go there. I don't know because we see it effective in one place mm -hmm. and then in another place. I mean, God doesn't say uh, go up up there on the hill and hold up your staff and I'll be with you. Right. It, we don't get that conversation. Yeah. We right. don't get that conversation, but I'm wondering is it's kind of connected because it seems to follow yeah. the previous section where it definitely was. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. It's yeah. Yeah. Because there, like you were saying, it, it's is this magical or not? Yeah. Or, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is 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 it the staff? Uh, that's that's the that's the magic. Is it is it something else? Is that just a vehicle? Like a, yeah, is it just a, a vehicle for that? What? That's where it's all. It's the what of holding it up? The obedience. the obedience of holding it up. Yeah, yeah, right. There is some faith, some some following, some obedience with that for sure. Yeah, and again, that's that's another. You know, there's obedience to this, but obedience to something we don't get to hear because we don't get to hear the the dialogue between. Um, uh, or the monologue from God to Moses about what to do here. Uh, so is this is this Moses saying, yeah, this is going to work and having faith? Or is God telling him to do it? Or, or what's happening here? We don't exactly uh, know that. But we don't get the conversation here, for sure. Yeah. All right. Other thoughts on this particular? Um, yeah. This battle will be... Um, yeah, it says, write this as a remembrance in a book and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. I don't know what books they had to write this in, but but this one's going to be important to be written down. And it will be retold and recalled as well kind of later on. Okay. Um, important to note here, because some people may have this question, they have a lot of these battles, they have a lot of these skirmishes. Uh, apparently, this is the only one that we have. So it says the people of Israel had come out of Egypt equipped for battle, we have in 1318. This brief unified story reports their first and only use of that equipment in the book of Exodus. So this is the only time that we have in Exodus where they take up arms and have to fight off. So it seems like the Amalekites were the problem in the wilderness. Okay. Yep. Okay. And there, to get back to your comment about the the, what was it, the prayer of faith and the sword of yeah, doing, prayer the staff of prayer, and the sword of action. Yeah, Trust, he says, trustworthy human leadership and active community defense will be needed to join, or will be needed to join with the divine will in the elimination of such an evil threat. So yeah, yeah, there is action that needs to be taken. Yep, okay. Isn't there a song in Dr. Dan talks about he called the, the altar he built the Lord is my banner. Isn't there a song about the banner or the Lord? Yeah. Banner over me is love. Banner over me is love. You're singing it before. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> His banner over me is love. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. Banner over me is love. All right. Yeah. All right. He goes into this staff having mag magical powers. That's sort of the explanation of what happens is that the outstretched hands are a prayer gesture. Um, um, so the staff conceived as having certain magical properties. Doesn't really see that. He, he thinks the sight of Moses with his hand and his staff outstretched gave encouragement to the Israelites and contributed to their effectiveness. So the point he makes here is the staff in and of itself does not radiate power like an electrical shock system, like a lightning bolt from God, so that Moses turns it on and off by raising and lowering it. It is a realistic symbol of the power of God at work in this situation, right? One of the things that I think is really important to always keep with us, well, always keep with us, but certainly in this story, and certainly Jesus hearkens to this, especially in the book of John with the I am statements. But when God's name is revealed to Moses, what does God say? What's, what's your name? I am. Okay. I am. That can also be translated in the Hebrew, I will be who I will be. Um, and I'm trying to remember the tense of that, if it has a future kind of, but, but what we have is a contextual God, a God who responds to the particular situation. Is God up there saying, okay, now I'm going to have the Amalekites attack, and now I'm going to have you do this, and now I'm like controlling this whole situation? 
I don't view God in that way. These, these situations happen. The chaos comes at the people of God, and God responds to that chaos, right? And so God shows up. God will be who God needs to be in a particular situation. And I'm guessing all of us, most of us at the very least, have had an experience where God shows up in a very particular way that speaks to a very particular situation. This is the incarnational God that we have. This is consistent then as we find, as we come to, to Jesus and what he's doing, we find a consistency with who God is and how God shows up for us. Um, obviously that's the, the unique revelation of God. I'm not saying that Jesus is just like this or it's the same or that kind of thing, but this is a consistent pattern for God of showing up and being who God needs to be uh, for us. And in my mind, I was totally wandered. Yep. Not that it ever happened. But... <laughs> Fair <laughs> I'm enough. Thinking of Moses and the law. I'm thinking yeah. of how stories have gotten weird of some of the same con concepts, like we have these magicians with their magic wands. Uh -huh. And yeah. we have Salem witches with their, yeah. you know, right. I'm just whole concept of, of something having power. Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. And I think, no, 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 you're not wandering at all. I think if we see the, again, I think if we see the, the staff as being the magical wand, you know, like the, like the hat in the Frosty the Snowman or something like that, without that, the power is gone, you know, kind of thing. I think we can start to see that God shows up in the, in the everyday in supernatural ways. God shows up in the natural and supernatural ways. I'll say that. Shows up in a friend. Shows up in a situation. Shows up in a stranger. Helper. Or whatever it be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're right on. Gloria has come. So I, I just yeah. was going to say, you know, I think it's interesting how when Moses' arms grew tired, Aaron yeah. and her supported him. Yeah. And it just reminds me of us supporting each other in yep. prayer. You know, exactly. Sometimes we feel like bold rangers, and it's such a comfort to have prayer warriors along with. It is. It is. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people, you know, you check in with them, they've been on the prayer concerns or something like that, and you check in with them, and they're like, oh, I'm really feeling, even if in the midst of it, even it's not resolved, it's not like, oh, yeah, the prayers really worked. Sometimes you hear that. But um, in the midst of it, I can feel the power of other people's prayers. Right. And we've seen even some scientific evidence of what that does. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay. Ready to go to 18? 15 yeah, minutes for a chapter. What's that? Could Moses have to rage of God to make his arms? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need blood in the fingers. Yeah. And water in the rock, blood in the fingers. Yeah. <laughs> I think it might be um, it might be a lesson for Moses though about getting that help. It doesn't say Moses asked for it, which would be in his pattern. He kind of he kind of tries to do everything by himself. Yeah. I between the weight of the staff and the weight of the cross. Mm. The weight of the staff, the weight of the cross. Yeah. Even Jesus has someone who, who picks up and carries or helps carry the cross. Right. Yeah. 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 Even there. Yeah. Well, yeah, we already passed that part, right? Yeah. The serpent's part. Yeah, you guys already had that. Yeah, I thought so. But yeah, and again, there even, oh yeah, I think we did that the first, maybe part of the first time I was here. But um, even that staff was then, what was it? It was, the Lord of the it, was staff it was, it was, well, the, the, the bronze serpents, remember, were put away. And they were carried along, and then later they're destroyed. You remember when, when we looked that up? Um, it's destroyed because it becomes an object of worship, yeah. right? And that's the issue here that we have. If it's the magical instrument that's the thing, then that becomes the object of worship, and that becomes a problem, right? We're back to that worship question again. Yeah. Who are we worshiping? What are we worshiping? Um, and oh boy, will we get into idolatry later. Yes. <laughs> okay, 18, Jethro. Um, and I know you're all thinking of the show. Um, struck, Jethro struck oil in the Southlands. Um, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law. Remember Jethro? Heard of all that God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. 
after Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, and his father-in-law uh, Jethro took her back along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he had said, I have been an alien in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he had said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. We can look at those names here real quick. So, um, resembles the word for alien there. And Eliezer, we should recognize Eli or El, the name for God, um, means my God helps Eliezer. I think we get that name later. Um, it comes up again. Not the same person. But... All right. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, along with Moses' sons and wife, came into the wilderness where Moses was encamped at the mountain of God. He sent word to Moses. I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed down and kissed him. Each asked after the other's welfare, and they went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had found them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, delivering them from the Egyptians. Okay. So Moses had been away from his wife and family. Right? Yeah, so apparently, unless there's, I'm sure there's commentary I missed or speculation, but we don't really get an explanation of this whole thing of sending his wife away. When I first read that, I thought, does that mean that they, that he had divorced her yeah. or had put her away, you know, kind of a thing. Doesn't sound like it. Right, right. That's the presumption is that there doesn't seem to be any, you know, ill Relation. division kind of thing going on in this in this relationship. Yeah. The, the name in my start the yeah. Bible yeah. references verse one and says that apparently Moses sent Zipporah and to her father with the news that the Lord had blessed his mission. Oh okay. and that he was in the vicinity of Mount Sinai. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I don't know um, if there's something in the sent away in Hebrew that would that would help us understand that. I didn't look that up, but but there may be. Okay. What's that? They got reconnected. Yeah, they got reconnected here. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, Jethro would have to know that, uh, you know, there must have been prox some proximity there, perhaps, or something like that. But yeah, yeah, right, right. Now, in contrast, of course, the Amalekites, the Midianites are friendly. And uh, and that's that hinges really on the fact that they're family here. So um, <clears throat> uh, Moses had taken, was it one or two daughters of Jethro? Was it one? Was it just the one? I want to say it was a couple, but... Yeah, at least, right? Yeah, yeah well, he did have two. He did have two? Thank you. Yeah. At any rate. <laughs> and that's where he was. He was with his father, Jethro. He was sheep herding for his, for his father-in-law, right? In the wilderness, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and the, with the herding bushes and all that. So there's kind of a reconnection here, too. This also will serve as kind of a way for us to understand that others are brought into this story. Right? This isn't just the story for this particular people and only their ancestors, but that others are brought into the story. So these Midianites are drawn kind of into the story. And we'll see kind of how Jethro reacts to that. Yeah. I like this NIV text note um, on, about sent away his wife. Uh -huh. It says, apparently Moses sent Zipporah to her father with the news that the Lord had blessed his mission. Yeah. That he was in the vicinity yeah. of Mount Sinai with Israel. Yeah, so right. So they not sending Zipporah yeah. until after they right. had defeated the Amalekites. Yeah, we need a microphone in here because, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, you both have the same. I don't know if it's exactly the same, but basically the same note. Yeah. yeah. Are you in an NIV study Bible? Are you in the same Bible? Okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember if the words were exactly the same, but it's certainly the same, same, the same thought. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Let's take a look here because there's a couple of notes I want to make and then we're going to swing right to the end of this chapter. I think we're going to make it. <laughs> All right. I do. I do. All right. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. All right. We did the Amal Amalekites. So our, here we are. Um, 
just want to see if there's anything here that might um, kind of add to what we're talking about. Um, yeah, so there's this concern of the integration of Moses' family into Israel's new identity as the Exodus community, community of faith. Um, and then let's look at this too, because we're going to see what Jethro does. So um, we have a couple of them already, but let's let's look as we get um, towards 10. Let's see, we have 10, yeah. So Jethro says, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh. Now I know, really important word here, that the Lord is greater than all gods because he delivered the people from the Egyptians when they dealt arrogantly with them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders uh, of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. Okay, really important piece here. What does Jethro do? How would you summarize that? He acknowledges God. He acknowledges God? Yeah. And the word no is an acknowledge. He worships. Yeah. He comes in to worship. So they've come into the tent, which we don't get a lot of information about what tent they're in, but it seems to be that he's come into the tent of worship, this portable, you know, kind of place of worship that they have, that the people have uh, to commune with God. Um, yeah, and he he um, says he hears first of all what we what we got before in verse in verse um, nine and 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 nine. previous to that eight and nine. Now he says he proclaims um, that word, and he says, "I know." Now, "know" in the scriptures is a really good, really important word. Anybody know it? I, I would, maybe Pastor Bill has drilled this one into you. I don't know. It's yada. Say it with me, yada. yada. All right. So we have this this word that means to know, very very important, and it's a word of relationship and it's a word of intimacy. There it is, right there. I can't blow this up for some reason, but yada to know, um, right here. And look where it's used in this particular particular place. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, "I have produced a man with the help of the Lord." All right, knowing the man knew his wife. We'll hear that again and again. And then there's a child. It's like, okay, he understood his wife. That's a miracle in itself. But um, how does that produce a child? Well, yeah, put two and two together here. So knowing knowing is used in in uh, our relational sense. We talked about this at Manny yesterday, and it's really important. Um, when we think of knowing as knowledge and head knowledge and understanding alone, and it is that we're missing a really, really big part of what it is to know in the scriptures. And again, if you've gone over this, I'm sorry for the repeat, but it's important enough to say a couple of times at least. So knowing is a relational word. It's like to embody. So when we hear, um, I don't think we get abide this week in chapter 17, but when we heard abide in me and I will abide in you, that's what knowing is, is kind of like. It's an abiding. I am the vine, you are the branches, um, is, is knowing. I'm, I'm in, I'm connected in, all right? So that kind of connection can be used with, with a relationship between a emotional. man and woman to conceive a child, but- Emotional. But it, but it has emotional, yes, it is yeah. the head, and it is the head, but it is also the heart, right? Right? Like so intimacy. intimacy, it is an intimate term. It's an understanding. Uh, those are all kind of synonymous with this word like to know. That you're aware of the right. heart knowledge as yeah. we are feeling it. Yes, you know? right. Yeah, there's very much a connection that goes with that. So it's intimate, relational kind of kind of word in the, in the scriptures. And it will come up again again and again. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> yeah, okay. And not to know is to, and knowing is a kind of a sense then of worship, of having that relation and then and having that interconnectedness and worship of God. And, it, and, it, and then, of course, that draws into faith. It's really connected to all of those particular things that are so important in the scriptures. Okay, that's a big one. Um, yeah, so Jethro hears. Jethro um, visits this community, goes into the tent, which is a sanctuary. Um, Moses declares the good news to, to Jethro. Jethro rejoices. He gives public thanks. He confesses and he presents an offering. These are all kind of signs of, of worship. And then we talked about the word no there. Um, and what's important here too, if you look in red here, this establishes the Exodus faith for the first time 
in a non-Israelite community. Okay, so first, this this establishes. If you look at the top red part, sorry, I can't blow it up, but establishes the Exodus faith for the first time. Oh, there we go. Now I can't move it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, for the first time in a non-Israelite community. So we have, you know, uh, go therefore and make disciples of all nations in a sense here, um, kind of a thing. Okay. All right. Other comments, thoughts on that? We'll move to the last piece. We've got just a few minutes, I know. All right. This one's just fun to read. Um, the next day, Moses sat as judge for the people while the people stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another, and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. <laughs> you will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You should represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. Teach them the statutes and instructions and make known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men among all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for all the for the peoples at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands, so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their homes in peace. So Moses, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from all Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor cases, case they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went off to his own country. Okay. We don't hear from Jethro again, by the way. But this is, Jethro comes in. But Moses listened. But Moses listened. And I think what's beautiful here is, brand new to the faith community and he offers his gifts and he brings a change to the community. A lot of times when somebody new comes into a faith community, it's like, yes, come and be one of us. Come and be like us. There's some good in that. But what I love to say to people when they're new in a, in a congregation is to say, it is so wonderful to have you here because we will be changed because of your presence. You're going to bring a new set of gifts that God has brought with you to this place. And we're going to be better or for you bringing those gifts to this place. Can't wait to see what that looks like, you know, kind of a thing. Rather than conform, conform, be like us, be like us. Obviously, yes, we can't start, you know, sacrificing chickens or something like that on the altar if that's what you like to do. There are limits, there are parameters, there's there are laws in that in that regard. But but certainly that that someone enhances the community. And Jethro does that immediately as he comes into this. And not only does he do it, but it is received. Uh, Moses is a is a horrible manager. And Jethro brings a kind of a duh order into this thing. Okay, there was one comment I think, and we'll pray and be out. Was there? Yeah. Was the law they were uh, administering yeah. uh, Leviticus. Well, um, yeah, I mean that's that's the we don't really have yeah. that at this point. Um, I don't know the order, the exact order of what laws they would have had at this time. So yeah, I had the same question as I'm reading through this. Um, so I don't know if there were other laws that have come up in this year study of Exodus or anywhere else, but, um, but he seems to refer to these laws, but I don't know that they've been necessarily given by God unless they've been revealed to Moses, um, uh, or if they're working off of some kind of system that they have from the Egyptians or, or what they're using here. So, yeah, yeah. Good question. Somebody will can research it for next time. Let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for your word this day. And we give you thanks for the gifts of all who are gathered here this day. Help us, guide us, uh, lead us to worship you, um, to look to you, um, especially in times of trouble, anxiety, or a, a feeling of loss. Help us also to cry out to you uh, with doubt and with faith 
uh, mingle together uh, and to receive all that you give. Uh, we give thanks for the ways in which you are working to bring life. Uh, we can see it before us this rain and this beautiful day. Help us to enjoy your creation and to see you in it and in uh, those we meet. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>